Now, this, uh, would, I would like now to invite the second speaker of this morning. Um, this is Professor Thomas Oeberg. He is working in the European Chemicals Agency in Helsinki, which I know personally very well because the JSC has handed over the European Chemicals Bureau some years ago to the agency which has been established. Um, Thomas Oeberg is professor at, um, he is a professor at, Le Le at LEAF from the Linnaeus University in Sweden, and he is chair of the Committee for Socioeconomic uh, Discussions. We are very much looking forward now to hear something about this socioeconomic analysis which is necessary in this respect. Professor Oberg, you have the floor. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much for that, and uh, thank you for inviting me to, to be here. Uh, we had a very interesting presentation now before. I was just thinking I'm chairman of one of the scientific committees of ECA, but maybe I'm more a chairman of a hybrid assembly because we have natural scientists, we have engineers and economists in this committee. But uh, <coughs> still I would see it as a, a technical task, not a, a policy task. But socioeconomic analysis is something that is sort of outside the, the scope of EFSA. So ECA, the European Chemicals Agency, with REACH has a, a wider mandate, you, you can say. But impact assessment has been around for, for a long time in uh, regulatory settings, and the European Commission started with this in 2003. And the questions basically to, to answer is, what, what are the benefits of a regulatory action? What are the corresponding costs? and how does benefit and cost compare. And here we can uh, also benefit from scientific technical advice. REACH, you know, stands, it's an acronym, stands for Registration, Evaluation, Authorization, Restriction of Chemicals. And the objectives of REACH, the first uh, that we know about, of course, very well, it's protect human health and environment. And also to promote alternatives to animal testing. We have touched upon that previous in this conference. But also there are uh, other tasks of REACH and that is to ensure the functioning of the internal market and enhance competitiveness and innovation, which is also a theme for, for this conference. And there are two REACH processes where socioeconomic analysis plays a vital role and that is authorization. That is the, uh, the process that after a given date, uses of substances listed in in Annex uh, 14 of REACH are banned unless specifically authorized. And restriction is then a European-wide ban of a substance or specific uses or uh, condition on specific uses. <laughs> so <coughs> as a basis then for, for regulatory decisions, uh, it's stipulated in, in REACH that uh, we have to evaluate whether risk to human health and or the environment is adequately controlled. Uh, the appropriateness of the proposals to reduce and control risk, the socioeconomic impacts of these proposals, and for authorization, uh, it should also be a driver for substitutions of the substances of very high concern. So the principles of uh, socioeconomic analysis are, are uh, then to provide this input, as I mentioned. But it's also to be noted that it's case specific, of course, and it's very much tied to the risk assessment. And this is the, the, actually the challenge, how to make this connection. And the, the role here, or the actors in REACH, is that it's the dossier submit, or a member state proposing a, a, a restriction or an applicant for authorization that prepare this impact assessment, the socioeconomic analysis. And the role of the committee of socioeconomic analysis is to review. So our op opinions are then reviews of proposals or applications. And then we have uh, the third important actor, the decision maker, the European Commission, that are then the end user of uh, the advice from uh, SEAC. Uh, <coughs> The scope I already been to uh, that we compare impacts, we can do it qualitatively or quantitatively, uh, preferably done in monetary terms. Uh, also important is the distribution of impacts. 
they may not uh, be equally distributed over the all countries or all groups in the country. And very important, which we had in the session yesterday, is the uncertainty analysis, which comes in both to the risk assessment part, but also the assessment of the impacts. And the impacts are then human health, environmental impacts, but then also economic impacts, social impacts, for example, in unemployment, and what we call sometimes wider economic impacts, trade, competition, and economic development impacts. And this is then to provide a fuller picture to the decision maker. And the linkage then to, to, uh, to risk assessment is then, of course, as you know, risk assessment start with a hazard assessment. Uh, is there a potential for the diverse uh, uh, health or environmental outcome? Uh, then risk assessment to answer uh, what, who will be negatively affected. Uh, then one step further, and this is then the, 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 the challenging part. What are the expected impacts on health in environmental society? So it's not enough for us to just say that there may be risk. We actually want to know what is the likely outcome also. Because if we have a likely outcome, then we may be able to value that outcome also and make these comparisons. So if I should uh, just try to connect this to EFSA's risk benefit assessment paradigm as uh, specified in, in their scientific opinion about that. You have on the, the, the left side here the normal risk characterization part from starting with hazard identification and a similar uh, tree on the, on the right and connecting to a risk benefit uh, comparison. But the question is then how to make this comparison. And one difference in uh, how we do it is actually that we put money on the impacts, we value the impacts. But there are all the other key difference is actually the, all the other impacts that we do consider them. Uh, and this we do whenever it's possible. And the costs are, are of course uh, easier to put in money. Benefits are sometimes much more difficult. If they are uh, market prices, then we can uh, use that. But for intangible impacts, we have to monetize it somehow. And often through an approach of willingness to pay, which can be estimated in various ways. I won't go into that now. And then another uh, aspect is then uh, impacts that occur in the future, where discounting is then uh, used to reflect preferences of both current and future generations. There are obvious uh, uh, advantages of using money as a common denominator because then we have something that we can use for comparison and balancing. And it also facilitates transparency because you have figures there that can be challenged and discussed around. And it can help then spotting also inequality in the distribution of risk. On the other hand, it adds another layer of uncertainty in estimating uh, the, or monetizing. And it may also be a trigger for, for resistance on moral grounds. Can you yield, really put money on human health and life? And uh, you could also say that it somehow a bit uh, reduces the flexibility of the policymaker because now you will have the numbers on the table to increase transparency. Uh, two examples then, uh, chromium in leather articles, we got a restriction proposal from Denmark a couple of years ago. Here it was quite easy to estimate the health impacts because we had clinical data. About uh, 10,000 cases could be uh, avoided per year uh, with this restriction. And it was then focused on imported leather articles, I should say, because it's not a problem with those produced in, in Europe. And we could then monetize these benefits, health uh, uh, treatment cost, uh, loss of uh, working time, etc., cetera, in to total about 100 million euro per year. And the cost to industry was actually about in the same range. So the conclusion, and we also had this voluntary shift by producers already. So the conclusion of the committee was that this uh, proposal was proportional and we supported it and it's actually part of European le uh, legislation now. 
Another restriction proposal was from Sweden, very far reaching, about lead containing consumer articles that could be mounted by children. And this uh, restriction was considered the most appropriate EU aid measure on certain conditions, concentration limit, transition period, and certain derogations. And here the total cost of the restriction was somewhat less, estimated to 2 million euros per year. The benefits was estimated uh, with regard to uh, avoiding uh, negative effects of cognitive abilities as measured by IQ tests. And here we couldn't do a full cost uh, benefit assessment, but a more um, break even approach to see at what uh, exposure would be needed to, to, to justify uh, this restriction. And actually, the whole of this uh, impact assessment was very much based on uh, EFSA's previous uh, opinion on lead. So EFSA experts played a vital role in, in this process also as advisors to the committee. And also here we found the proposal to be proportional. I mentioned also authorization cases. We have so far issued 55 opinions on authorization applications, and we have hundreds of more coming in the pipeline now, so that put a high pressure on the committee. And uh, here the burden of proof is on industry, and the direct costs are often uh, easy than to estimate for the industry, but the indirect cost to uh, society is much uh, more difficult, and cost of alternatives may not be fully known. And difficult cases for, for us are when the benefit of the authorization outweigh the monetized health impacts, but at the same time you have a high or a large health risk. Uh, but we can also, in our opinions that we issue together with the Risk Assessment Committee, suggest additional uh, risk management measures, monitoring requirements, and also a very short review period when company has to come back and apply again. And short review period can also be uh, introduced if there are qu major quality issues with an application. So the normal review period is uh, seven years. Short can be four or shorter than that. And for some, we also suggest longer review periods, like 12 years. Uh, some specific considerations then is that uh, industry usually have relevant information about cost uh, and uh, the feasibility of alternatives. But there is an asym asymmetry in the information uh, availability in that uh, member states, for example, that uh, need to prepare a restriction proposal, they have very much to rely on the data that they can get from industry and it's not always that easy to collect that data. And generally, uh, benefits are uh, difficult to quantify due to externalities, uh, public good characteristics. We don't have market prices. I could just mention as one very challenging example, PBT compounds. What is the value of avoiding uh, having some persistent pollutant uh, uh, accumulating in the environment, in the Arctic environment? And this is something we also have to deal with in our opinions. And then the acceptability of this discounting can also, of course, be an issue. And the risk of the alternatives may be less well known. But uh, my sort of take home message would be then that uh, knowing about the risk is not enough. Uh, the potential harms need to be quantified and compared also to the benefits that the society gets out of using a substance. And uh, balancing regulatory impacts requires that we, or it's at least simplified by having a common unit. And uh, money is then a, a suitable unit for that, but you could also conceive other metrics. And of course, you can also conceive other ways of evaluating proportionality. And there, sort of the challenge is to the scientific community if you can find other uh, methodology. In our guidance, actually, multi-criteria decision-making is also mentioned, but it hasn't been applied yet in any of the dossiers that we have handled. Uh, yeah, the outlook, it, it, the analysis is challenging. We have scientific challenges, but we also have, the, as I mentioned, the quantitative challenges. Uh, and there is, of course, plenty of room for improvement. We could do that then in, in collaboration with the scientific community. And if I want to 
put my, my sort of finger to one specific, it is how to uh, estimate uh, the health impacts, how to estimate the, 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 the benefits going from the risk assessment to the impact assessment. And they're going from, for example, animal studies to estimating the impact to human health. And there is a lot of resistance uh, uh, among scientists to do that. They, they are not com comfortable at all to do that. Uh, but they are comfortable to estimate risks for, for humans. So I don't understand this sort of dichotomy there, really. And then I would like also to ask back now to you uh, that come from other regulatory areas that uh, wouldn't that uh, other places than chemicals also benefit from a scientific view on the impacts? Or is it only the industrial chemicals we can have this? So with that, I'd like to close and thank you and also thank those that helped me prepare the slides. Thank you very much, Professor Uberg. Um, socioeconomic analysis is challenging. We have understood this and complex because this is very often and used more and more everywhere. And I like very much your statement you said here, the risks of the alternatives are well known. We do loads of studies on particular substances and then we uh, come to new approaches, but then we do not know whether this is better. We already move to new compounds, and sometimes we don't know whether they are as well as good as the others. So thanks a lot. Is uh, there one question maybe? Yes, please, Leo. Yeah. Well, Mike, Mike is coming. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bernadette Ossendorp from RIVM in the Netherlands. What? Stand up. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I was thinking about your uh, example of the work of the SEAC, uh, which, uh, as far as I know, is composed by scientists. But then you told me that they were making a decision about proportionality. So do the, the benefits out outweigh the risks or not, and the monetary implications of that? And my feeling was that that perhaps would be more a uh, risk manager's decision to take, whether or not this is uh, better or not. I, I was wondering about the, um, who is making this decision about the proportionality. It wasn't completely clear to me. We, uh, we, uh, sorry. we, we give an opinion uh, about uh, proportionality based on, on uh, the facts that are presented, but of course, very important to state all the uncertainties involved. Then the final decision about the uh, restriction proposal or to grant the authorization is taken by the European Commission or through the member states in the REACH committee. So we are not uh, making any policy decisions, but yes, we are into risk management, but not into policy. The policy is left there. So we, for example, in, in SEAC, we don't discuss the precautionary principle. But in the REACH committee, of course, the precautionary principle could be invoked based on our opinion and our statements about all the uncertainties involved. So we just try to collect and give the best possible technical scientific advice to the decision maker. So I would rather like to see, our, as we do, the distinction is between science and policy, not between risk assessment and risk management. So we are into risk management, that's true, but scientific advice on risk management. <coughs> Um, let me just check. Yes, a very quick one, please. <laughs> Jean-Louis Bresson, Assistance Publique, Paris. Thank you very much for, for this very clear presentation. Um, the way of assessing the health consequence is obviously critical to your process. Um, I will take the example you gave of IQ evaluation. Are you just considering IQ reduction or also considering all the social implication that might have such a reduction on the long term, which is quite another issue. In, in uh, this opinion, it was limited only to the, to the, to the uh, monetizing the, the effect of, of the cost for, from, from uh, IQ loss. But actually, the, the, what you can sort of, uh, IQ loss was then sort of a marker. Of course, there the could be much wider 
implication impacts that could also be considered, and that was mentioned in our opinion. But that was the best we could do on the basis of the epidemiological data that had previously been evaluated by EFSA then. And also I should say that uh, our opinions need not necessarily cover everything, it's more that it should be fit for purpose. And also important that we don't do the assessment, we evaluate others' assessments. So it was our review report of this. So we, we can't expand the scope really if a, a dossier submitter focus on something, then we can't start to assess something else. Thank you very much. Uh, we have opportunity to raise more questions later on uh, at the panel discussion.